This video is going to discuss the basic relationship between processors and their memory. At a high level, we can think of the processor as a block that communicates with memory through a couple of signals. It provides memory with an address that it either wants to read or write, and then depending on whether it's reading or writing data, either memory changes its data based off of the inputs from the processor, or the memory returns a piece of data back to the processor. And in an ideal situation, the processor and memory operated similar speeds. And ideally that similar speed would mean that a memory read or write to the memory could happen in a single processor clock cycle. So that any time a processor requests a piece of data that the memory returns it in a single cycle. Unfortunately, that hasn't been true for over 30 years. This figure here shows the relative speed or performance of both processors and memory over the last 30 some odd years and you can see that while the processor performance has grown exponentially memory performance has grown much slower than that and so while back in 1980 memory and processors might have had similar performance these days there is a very large gap between the speed or performance of a microprocessor and the speed of memory and so the challenge that designers have to deal with is how do we make a memory system that appears to be ideal? One that has, is fast, cheap, and also has a large capacity. And the challenge is that there's no existing technology that provides all three of these features. This table shows the three common types of memory technologies available, and each of these different technologies have different trade-offs. So an SRAM is very fast and so could achieve the speed that would be desired, but storing information in SRAM consumes a fairly large amount of area and space. And it also was fairly expensive to store a bit compared to some other technologies. Another technology, DRAM or dynamic RAM, is more dense than SRAM, but is also slower. So you're not quite as fast as you need to be to keep in track with the processor. And that is actually what the previous figure was showing was DRAM versus the processor. RAM. And even slower than that are disks, which are very dense and very cheap in terms of their cost per bit, but are even slower than DRAMs are. And so the solution to creating our semi-ideal fast, cheap, and large memory is to use a hierarchy of memories to try to approximate this ideal. And so to try to get the benefits of the fast SRAM with the higher densities of a DRAM or a disk. And to do this, we create a hierarchy of memory with the microprocessor sitting at the top. And just below that, we put some fast SRAM, which we refer to as the cache, near the microprocessor. Below that, we have some main memory composed of DRAM. And below that, we have what is referred to as virtual memory, which is usually composed of some sort of disk, whether it's a hard disk drive or more recently solid state drives. But in any case, each of these different technologies have different trade-offs in speed and capacity, and so we put the fast but fairly small caches near the microprocessor, and then we put larger and larger but slower memories further away from the processor. And the hope is that most of our accesses to memory from the microprocessor will hit in the levels close to the microprocessor, so hopefully most of them will hit in the fast cache or the fast SRAM, and so to the microprocessor it will appear that our memory is fast but also has the capacity of the larger lower levels. The only way that this memory hire works is if we actually are able to access or find most of our information in the small and fast SRAM. Most of the time these work because programs and memory references that tend to exhibit localized access. This is something that's empirical, meaning that it's true in most programs, but it's not guaranteed to be true for all programs, which is why there can be variability between different programs and how well they make use of a memory hierarchy. So as an example of what locality is, here we have an example of a simple piece of C code, which is basically summing up all of the values in an array. And if we were to look at how this program would access the values in memory over time. If we were to look at the values of my array, the first iteration through the loop, it would access my array zero, and then a little bit of time later when it gets to the second iteration, it would access my array one, and then a little bit later, it would access my array two, and then three, and this would continue on. 
And so this example here shows an example of what's referred to as spatial locality. And the idea of spatial locality is that if you have used data recently, then you are likely to use data close to it soon as well. And in this example, we saw, well, we first accessed memory array zero, and then very soon after that, we also accessed things nearby it, which would be memory array one, two, and three. And so to exploit this type of locality, when we access some data, we want to bring nearby data into the higher levels of the memory along with it. So that's an example of one type of locality. Another type of locality we can observe with this code would appear if we look at the instructions that would be executed and that have to be accessed from memory. So if I was to expand this C code into assembly code, this shows one example of how this could be implemented in assembly code. And if we were to look at how these instructions would be accessed from memory over time, we would see that the first time through the loop, we first access the first instruction, and then the second, and then the third, and continuing until we got to the jump. And then after the jump, we would go back to the beginning of the loop, and we basically repeat the same thing, accessing the same instructions in a row. And so if we look at this, we can see that a particular instruction is actually accessed repeatedly over time. And this leads to the idea of what's referred to as temporal locality. Temporal locality says that if data is used recently, it is likely to use it again soon. And so to exploit this, we want to keep recently accessed data in higher levels of the memory hierarchy. And so then finally, to quantize how well a particular memory hierarchy is doing, we have a couple of common metrics that we use. First off, some terminology. We say that something is a hit in a particular level of the hierarchy if it is found in that level of hi the hierarchy. So if we look for an address and it is found in the cache, then we say it is a cache hit. Or if it is found in main memory, we say it hits in main memory. Alternatively, if it is not found in a given level of the hierarchy, then it is called a miss. And so that means we have to go to the next level of the hierarchy. And so we can be interested in how often we are hitting or missing in a particular level of the hierarchy. And we'll refer to this as the hit rate or the miss rate. And so the hit rate is the number of hits over the overall number of accesses. And you could also calculate this if you knew the miss rate. So if you knew the miss rate, you could say the hit rate was 1 minus the miss rate, because anytime you're missing, it means you're not hitting. And similarly, for the miss rate, it's the number of misses divided by the number of accesses. And you could also compute it using the hit rate. So it's 1 minus the hit rate. And so this gives you an idea of how well locality is being exploited. So are we being able to find most of the stuff in our cache or in our main memory? And then along with this, we can also be interested in how long on average does it take us to access data when the processor asks for a piece of data or an instruction. And this is referred to as the average memory access time. And as an example of how you'd calculate this, if we had a system with the three levels that we showed before, so one level of cache, main memory, and then virtual memory beyond it, we could calculate the average memory access time in the following way. So first off, every access would have to go to the cache to see if it's there. So we'd have the time to access the cache. If it doesn't hit in the cache, meaning we miss in the cache, so if we look at the miss rate for the cache, so if it misses in the cache, then we have to go to the next level, which in this example is main memory. So it would then be, for all the times we miss, it's the time to access the cache plus the time to access main memory. And then further, if we were to miss in main memory, so for whatever the miss rate is of main memory, if we miss in main memory, we then have to go to the last level, which is our virtual memory. 
and we'd get the data there. And so an equation like this would show how we could calculate the average memory access time for a system with one level of cache, main memory, and then virtual memory.